Welcome to the skies over Colorado for November 2020. I'm staff astronomer John Ensworth for Longmont Public Media of Cherrywood Observatory and volunteer at the Little Thompson Observatory in Berthoud. Astronomy news this month. NASA's OSIRIS-REx has stowed its bite out of the asteroid Bennu. This is an image of the robot storing the sample on board. It did so earlier this week. It dug about 19 inches below the surface and got between a half and one and a quarter pounds of material. So really very good. OSIRIS-REx launched September 8th, 2016, and it may return the material March 2021. That has yet to be fully nailed down. There's a picture of Bennu. This may be an unusual one to cover, but SpaceX is opening its Starlink satellite internet to public beta testers. You must purchase Starlink ground equipment for about $500 and pay a $100 monthly fee for the service. There's a picture of one of the launches. They are launched 60 per batch starting around May 2019. The reason it matters to astronomers is because even though they're working to make these less reflective, at least soon after launch, they do reflect a lot of sunlight in the evening and the morning sky and definitely mar astronomers' view of the universe. A mystery has been solved in astronomy. Fast radio bursts now have a known cause. These are very powerful radio bursts that last only milliseconds, 0 0.001 second. We now know them to be formed by magnetars or magnetic stars. These are stellar remnants, neutron stars that form an extremely powerful magnetic field. They have flares that erupt on the surface. It takes a while for that material to leave and then the next flare seems to impact with the earlier particles releasing a colossal amount of energy. This is a month's worth of solar energy in that tiny twinkling of time. Earth's magnetic field is 10 to the minus 5 Tesla where the magnetic fields around these magnetars approach 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 11th. That is fantastically, ridiculously powerful. Well, we're leaving fall and heading deep into the winter. Traditionally, there aren't very many star parties over the winter because of the harsh conditions. Even if the nights are long, the skies are beautiful. The deep south sky gaze in Sandy Hook is still on for November 10th through 15th, but the Death Valley Star Party has been canceled. Your Astronomy 101 for this month is what makes stars twinkle. Starlight is a tiny stream of photons coming from very, very, very distant light sources, and they are from our point of view, very, very close to a single point source of light. The atmosphere is turbulent with warm air rising, cool air sinking. These different bubbles of air have different densities, warmer being less dense, cooler being more dense. So they act like random prisms that bend the light this way and that, and even smear the light apart like the, a prism does, making little flickers of color. Stars hot overhead don't twinkle very much because there's very little atmosphere between you and outer space. It may only be about five or 10 miles of pretty thick stuff. The long path coming in from the horizon has a long way to go and a lot of atmosphere to distort it, redden it, and make it blur and twinkle. Stars, being point sources of light, 
can get jostled around very easily and you see a smear twinkly image from a star when the seeing is not good. Planets have some size so even if it jitters around a little bit there's paths through the atmosphere that kind of create the original image right where it is. You can see in a telescope or binoculars that it's fuzzier but to the eye just looking up into the sky, planets are always overlapping themselves. So as a general rule of thumb, unless the seeing is really bad, like right after a very powerful cold front come, came through in the winter, stars twinkle and planets do not. Another neat thing the atmosphere does is it bends moonlight and sunlight from below the horizon to where you can see it. The sunrise and sunset charts you have are corrected for this, but if you know where the sun actually is, the sun rises a little earlier than it should and stays in the sky a little longer than it should. Let's take a look at the skies above your backyard. Looking at the moon, we had the full moon on Halloween night. That was a blue moon. It's the first full moon since 1944, if I found that out correctly. So we have the last quarter, November 8th, new moon, middle of the month, first quarter right before Thanksgiving, and the very last day of the month is our full moon, just like in October. Planets in November. In the dusk and evening sky, down in the southwest, you'll see Jupiter first, then Saturn, Jupiter being the brighter one. They set before midnight, but Mars is high in the sky, in the eastern sky at sunset. So here's Jupiter, Saturn, Mars is way up here. Neptune's up here too, but it's just hard to see. On either side of midnight, Neptune crosses the meridian an hour or so after sunset. Uranus crosses the meridian a couple hours later. Mars is up basically all night, and it's very bright for Mars, but it is beginning to dim. We are starting to leave it behind. So looking out at midnight, or just after midnight, you can see Mars down in the southwestern sky now. Uranus up here having crossed the meridian, Neptune just beginning to set. In the morning sky, we've got very bright Venus, and Mercury is going to be at its greatest elongation on the 10th, which means it's as high above the sun as it will get this time. Venus rises a couple hours or more before sunrise, but it's beginning to dim. In the pre-dawn sky of November 10th, when Mercury is at its best, it's located here with Venus right above. Here's the sun just beginning to come up, and in reality, the sky in the east would be getting quite bright at this point. See a little sliver moon as it's heading towards new on the 10th. November 1st, we just set the clocks back. So the sunrise switched to 6.29 a.m. with the sunset at 4.47 with about 10 hours and a half of daylight. Looking at the end of the month, November 30th, the sunrise is now backed up a half hour to 7 a.m. Sunset is actually at 436. I'll be driving home in the dark. And the day shortens to nine hours and a half. It is a whole hour over this month. The altitude of the sun at local noon will drop from 35 degrees down to 29 degrees. Only a third of the way up from the southern horizon to the zenith. Our feature object predictably is Mars this time. This is a NASA JPL image. You won't see that from the surface of the Earth because of that twinkling and other reasons. It's far. In binoculars, Mars kind of looks like this. A little fuzzy dot. In a small telescope, you'll get maybe some darker patches with the lava fields, a hint of a polar ice cap on one side. It's a little whiteness on the upper left. So you can get some features in a small telescope with Mars. Your observing challenge this month will be the minima of Algol. 
the constellation Perseus is kind of high up in the eastern sky in the evening. But the brightest star is Mirfak over here on the left. But down this leg of the constellation is the next brightest star, Algol. It dims very noticeably. That dimness lasts about two hours and it occurs every almost 2.9 days. It goes from a bright, reasonably bright 2.1 magnitude down to a noticeably dim 3.4. It's 30% dimmer. This is an eclipsing binary. You have two stars orbiting each other and one goes in front of the other, the dimmer one blocking more light. There's a little dip on the opposite side, but it's harder to notice. Taking a look at the beginning of one of the minima this month, it's a good, good time to see it. It could be November 12th, just after 10 o'clock to 11 p.m. Looking into the eastern sky, here's Orion coming up. Taurus, the Pleiades, and then the upper left is Perseus, and there's Agol right there. So straight up in the east, just after 10 p.m. Go out an hour or two before that, take a look at how bright it is, and then come out after 10, maybe around 10.30, and see how dim it has become. If you stay up till midnight or one, it will return to its full brightness. Astronomy events near Longmont. Longmont Astronomical Society, November 19th, will have a Zoom meeting, our galaxy, the app and the real thing by Bill Sumi. I did not write that in there, sorry. November 21st would have been their open space star party, but that's canceled still. Would have been at 5.30 p.m. because the nights are getting so long. Little Thompson Observatory's public night. Uh, they're still closed through early April now of 2021 but we may begin Zoom meetings in November, so keep an eye on starkids.org for that. Estes Park Memorial Observatory is gonna be closed for the end of the year now. And keep an eye on what they might be doing early next year at angelsabove.org. Northern Colorado Astronomical Society, November 5th at 6.15 p.m., so this will uh, be on archive, I'm sure. Dr. Jeremy Darling, talking about our universe via webcast. You have to go to nocoastro.org and request the link. Fisk Planetarium is doing domed home virtual programs every Wednesday at 7. And then on November 19th at 7 p.m. they have fires, flooding, heat waves, drought, extreme events, and a changing climate. I didn't mark the speaker down for that either. Sorry about that. And there are open house observatory evenings are still canceled. In my further reading section this month, old school star atlases. They've been largely replaced by apps and programs, but I like books. The Cambridge Star Atlas is a good one by Will Tyrion. Turn Left at Orion is a good beginner's guide. Burnham Celestial Handbooks are old but classics, Volume 1 and Volume 2, take you through the constellations alphabetically and highlight many of the objects that you can observe in telescope and binoculars in them. If you have any additions or corrections, contact me, John Unsworth, at gmail.com. This has been the Skies Over Colorado for November 2020. Keep looking up.